Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about culture and does capitalism destroy culture? And so it's kind of a provocative title, um, does capitalism destroy culture? It's also a huge topic. Um, and so I'm going to touch on a couple of things that I think are, are maybe interesting. Hopefully I'll be provocative and hopefully I will um, be able to uh, provoke some questions during the, the Q&A discussion. Um, it's an interesting question because first of all, if you ask, what does capitalism destroy culture? Well, there's a couple of really big important questions, right? One of them is, what do you mean by capitalism? And another one is, what do you mean by culture? Right? So there are various definitions of capitalism, and I'm not going to get into some kind of very academic um, you know, definition, distinctions of all the types of capitalism. But generally, when we think of capitalism, we understand the idea that there's private property, that there's free exchange that businesses are able to form reasonably uh, easily and people can make decisions uh, and a lot of the, that there's private ownership of the capital. Now, opposed to things, say, socialism, where you have, or communism, where you have government ownership of capital, or corporatism, where there's strong relationships between business and, um, and government, or also fascism, where you have theoretically private, uh, private business, but it's very strongly influenced by the state. So capitalism is usually the sense of kind of openness and freedom. Now as we know that even though we live in a so-called capitalist economy, I don't think we could say that the United States or Western Europe is a free market economy. So you've heard me and some of my colleagues talk about, about various types of what we've called managerial capitalism. Uh, you have strong relationships between the government and especially big business. Um, and so we have a capitalist economy, but there are different varieties of capitalism. Another type of capitalism that's quite problematic is called oligarchy. A lot of times what you experience is, say, in places like Latin America, you have, you have the end of, of socialism, and then you start out with liberalism and free markets. But it's not really free markets. It's big businesses and big families in cahoots with the government, with high protective tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's also called capitalism. So the, one of the problems with capitalism is that there are so many different types of definitions that you can kind of go, you can go after one of them that you want. So but keeping, I'm not going to try to use one, but I'm saying generally let me talk about free markets, okay, free market capitalism. And I also recognize that in some ways that's somewhat of an ideal since we don't have that here. But let's just talk about capitalism with all those distinctions in mind. Let's think about kind of a free market. Now, that's another question is what do we mean by culture? Right? Do we mean an anthropological definition of culture? A sociological definition of culture? Do we mean what Matthew Arnold said when he said the best that has been thought and said? Do we mean high culture? Like art and music as opposed to popular? So classical music and, and, and Renaissance art as opposed to, say, Britney Spears? I mean, what do we mean by culture? Now, Rodney Stark, some of you have maybe read Rodney Stark's book, The Victory of Reason, or have seen him in our, in our documentary, The Birth of Freedom. Rodney Stark says in his sociology book, culture is the sum total of human creations, intellectual, technical, artistic, physical, and moral. It's a complex pattern of living that directs human social life. Daniel Chiro says that cultures interpret our surroundings for us, and they help give those surroundings meaning and allow us to express ourselves. Um, language, religion, science, art, our notions of right and wrong, um, expla explanations of the meaning of life, all of these things, Chiro argues, are part of culture. Now, you also have anthropological understandings of kind of the ways of living. So you go back and look at a more, what you'd call maybe a primitive culture, and, and you have how these people live and operate with one another. And then there's another understanding of culture that I'll come back to at the end, and that's Christopher Dawson. Christopher Dawson is a, a, a Catholic historian, an English historian, um, and he said that culture, the driving force of culture, is cultus, or religion. Cultus shapes culture. Now there's another question as well. If you look at someone like, like a lot of times, the real beginning of the word culture, where it became in kind of our modern parlance, is not actually an old word. Um, it comes in the Enlightenment, with thinkers like Kant, dealing with Rousseau's questions of how do we relate between nature and civil 
society or society. Rousseau wrote a very provocative piece on how, whether arts and sciences are actually good for humanity or not. And he, he, this was right around the Enlightenment. Everyone was excited about progress. And Rousseau came out and said, well, maybe a couple good things, but there's a lot of bad things. Look at kind of the effeminate French court versus kind of a Spartan manly lifestyle. And so Rousseau kind of shook things up. And this began people to think about the question of culture. And then with the Enlightenment, when you have this idea that, well, everybody's exactly the same and we can kind of understand the way things are and grow up from superstition, as Kant said, the Romantics came and said, well, wait a minute. People are different. Germans experience reality in a different way than the English people do, right? Italians experience reality in a different way. And so this whole concept of culture and how we know things. So there's a lot of things going on. So even in my provocative title, Does Capitalism Destroy Culture?, um, it's almost unanswerable because we'd have to spend like 25 hours in a big long textbook saying, well, what do you mean by capitalism are the following seven things, right? But nevertheless, as Sam said, there's still a general kind of worry when we talk about capitalism that has some negative effects on culture. So putting that in mind, let, let me start to say, to try to address some of the things that I think they're out there and then give you some of the, the, my views on, on this. Um, some of the concerns that capitalism destroys culture. People are, have been worried about capitalism uh, since the beginning. Uh, we'll talk about when the beginning was in a little bit. Um, but I think especially in the last couple of years with the financial crisis and with other cultural and social breakdown, people are, are more, even more worried now than they were before. And so this is a, a recurring theme. And you see an interesting kind of mix between left and right. This is not a left concern or a right concern. You see Christians and secularists all kind of concerned about what's happening to our culture. Are we having a breakdown? Is there more anonymity? Are people, is there uh, this radical individualism that's taking place? And so you see, um, interestingly, say, very serious um, uh, Christians with kind of a traditionalist bent worried about the negative effects of capitalism. And then you see kind of progressive left-wingers worrying about things. I watched a documentary last night called Food Incorporated. Okay, and uh, there's this whole question that maybe you've heard the guy, the guy Michael Pollard, I think he wrote, defense of food. Um, and there's a big concern about does industrial agriculture kind of ruin our, our, our lifestyle. Now there's a movement called the slow food movement. Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay, the slow food movement comes from Italy and it's actually saying, well, we need to take time and sit down with our families and, and, and have, have dinner together, you know, and, and non-processed food, et cetera. Well, it was started by communists. Okay? Now, interesting. I, mean, I think it's a little bit incoherent, but it's interesting that you see in the left and the right. I mean, communists are also big industrialists and they don't really believe in the family, but they think you should sit down and have non processed food. They also believe in collectivizing agriculture, right? They believe in ca collectivizing agriculture, but they also want non processed organic small farms. Okay? So I don't know how coherent it is, but it's a very interesting thing that's happening. So you see, you also see the fact that capitalism destroy traditional culture with the rise and incre increase of globalization as capitalism goes into places of Africa and Latin America and Asia. Does it disrupt culture and destroy it? Walmart versus local business. You know, you have big ugly box stores versus local business. Are we losing something there? Small is beautiful. Right? Big, by the way, is cheap, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole question of industrialization. Is industrialization the same thing as capitalism? Vulgarity in culture, consumerism, homogenization, deracination, deracination meaning like you lose rootedness. <coughs> technology, is technology bad for social life? Okay, there's a guy, he wrote a book called Better Off. He was studying technology at MIT. He said, I'm going to go and he lived with the Amish for a year, he and his wife. And so he said, how it's better not to have uh, technology. He now lives in St. Louis, but he's still, but, but he's still trying to live minimally in technology. Um, you have the crunchy cons. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, in, in Catholic circles, you have the distributivists, right? Uh, people who follow Chesterton and Belloc, who are concerned about kind of big industrial culture and capitalism and liberalism. And then you have the agrarians. The agrarians are in, in coming back. The agrarians come from the, the 12 Southerners who wrote a book called I'll Take My Stand in the 30s. Um, and you have this sense of let's move back to an agrarian culture away from kind of industrial city culture that's terrible, et cetera. Um, so the problem, of course, is you know, how do we deal with these things? I'm going to throw a couple of these things out, and, and, and I'm going to argue that capitalism does create 
disruption. It creates social change, to be sure. Sometimes good and sometimes bad. But I think it goes too far to argue that capitalism destroys culture. Not only because it's difficult to answer, as I said, but also because I think that the driving force of social organization is not the economy. That's the Marxian understanding, and it's widely accepted. I would argue, I would agree with Christopher Dawson that the driving force of culture is cultus. Okay, so let me throw a couple of these things out and, uh, and uh, to kind of put some of these questions in perspective. For example, traditional culture I mentioned. If capitalism, a free market economy, innovative, competitive free market economy comes into a place of Latin America or Africa, is it going to, is it going to disrupt culture? Absolutely. But guess what? So will socialism. Okay, I mean, okay, we're going to collectivize the agriculture. That's going to disrupt it too. Um, now, so there are some changes, but there are also some benefits. Right? And some, in some ways, there's actually a development of local culture. Tyler Cowen, in his book called Creative Destruction, deals with this. And he says, he points out that sometimes through importing certain things local, and, and having more money, local cultures are actually ab able to develop their artisan skills and their products. And if they're connected into a global economy, guess what? You can buy them at Macy's. Okay? And so you actually have a combination. It, maybe it disrupts local culture, but it also helps develop local artisanal culture. In Ghana, 71% of the music sold in Ghana is made where? In Ghana. Okay, now here's another problem. Is sometimes we've confused westernization and modernization. How many in this room, and I know you're in Michigan, so you might be reticent to admit this, but how many in this room have ever, do own any Japanese products? A Japanese car, Sony, anything? Okay. Traders. All right. Um, um, so how many of you can tell me what is in the back at the, when you go into a Shinto temple, how many can tell me what you find in the end? How many know what Shinto is? Okay, well wait a minute. You guys have been using Japanese products for 20 years. You must have been Japanized. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Right, like Americanized, okay? Right, sometimes what we do is we confuse the fact that we use products from a certain place. Oh, thank you. We use products from a certain place with the idea that somehow that culture. And so for, we, we see a, a young man wearing his baseball hat backwards or wearing like, you know, a Chicago Bears shirt and we think, oh, he's American, he's lost his culture. But you use Sony and Toyota and a host of other products, and you have no idea about Japanese culture. It's a mirror, by the way. Okay, um, that's what's in the back of a Shinto temple. Um, I lived in Japan, so I happen to know that. <laughs> um, so, what happens? I think we, sometimes we we assume sometimes, and so that's one problem. Now, sometimes, guess what? Capitalism destroys lo local culture. And guess what? I'm going to argue something not politically correct. That's sometimes good. Because sometimes local indigenous cultures, wherever they are in the world, are broken. Right? They're messed up. And so sometimes some disruption actually allows people to have more freedom and more <laughs> dignity. So I reject the, the, the cultural relativism of, of um, anthropology and say sometimes it actually is a positive thing that these cultures are changed because these cultures might have some serious weaknesses that maybe oppress women, etc. Now, um, Related to this, I mean, related to this, you have this whole kind of related to this, you have this idea that well, when you have WalMarts come in, big companies come in, it destroys something of the local relationship, and it and it really just kind of makes everything ugly. Well, I'll agree with you that WalMarts are eyesores, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But um, and it can hurt local businesses, and you can have lower quality things, absolutely. But, number one, shopping shouldn't be that important morally. I mean, big deal if you know, oh my goodness, I have to shop at Walmart instead of the local <laughs> hardware store. I mean, it's not that big of a deal that you have to go to Lowe's. I mean, it's not like killing your soul that instead of hard shopping at, the, you know, at Van Kuyken's hardware, you've got to shop at, at Lowe's. 
<laughs> Unless, it, but here, if it were Van Lowe's, it would be fine. Okay. <laughs> now, the other thing is there are a lot of benefits. For example, it's lower cost. People at Walmart can shop at Walmart. They can buy things cheaper, and they can actually spend money on higher culture. Now, I know that this is, doesn't always happen. And this is, in fact, one of the critiques of the Southern agrarians. Donald Davidson argues that they told us industrialism would have people reading Shakespeare and humming Beethoven. But nobody's reading Shakespeare or humming Beethoven. Instead, they're going to banal movies. Okay? But the question is, is that caused by a free market, by industrialization, or is it caused by something else? The other thing is the local idea is sometimes a hollow brand. How many of you in this room like coffee? How many of you drink local coffee? There is no local coffee. Right? So the people that are saying local, local, local are, re are relying upon free, globalized economies of trade, more or less. Right? More or less. Okay. So, um, so there's a host of other things that, that go on with that. Another idea, another problem is that capitalism creates vulgarity in art. Now listen, I'm wearing a three-piece suit. Okay? So I, I, you can tell I probably don't like Britney Spears very much. Okay? <laughs> Um, and I think there are d d very serious problems with modern, modern contemporary art, even high, quote unquote, high culture contemporary art, um, and also with what you see on television and, and MTV and the radio station. I think it's very, very serious problems. Um, I would argue that the level of art, of architecture, of music has decreased so far that you could even say it's very decadent in many ways. Okay? You have. Britney Spears. You have all this horrid kind of abusive women rap music stuff that you see. I mean, you just see, you see some terribly ugly architecture. You see a host of things going on. All right. So, have you been to the Grand Rapids Art Museum? Have you seen their neo-expressionism <coughs> exhibit? Okay. Neo-expressionism is horrible. It's not art, it's ugly, it's nothing, it's terrible. But somehow it's very expensive and everybody, all these you know, kind of elites, uh, in New York affirm one another, look at my terrible piece. Oh, you're wonderful. And it's all part of a brand. So your art actually becomes cool because if I, if, if I were somehow had some kind of weird thing I could brand myself with, then if I made something, my art would be cool because I'm cool. Right? But I'm, well, I am cool. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> now, the problem with art is that modern art and, and contemporary art, a lot of it's just self-expression process and innovation. But what happens if you have a boring self? Then your self-expression is, well, go to the Grand Rapids Art Museum and look at the neo-expressionist <laughs> exhibit. Okay, but is that caused by capitalism? Is it caused by industrialism? Okay, notice you can't even look at the art and it says like, this is Bush administration something or other, you know, or, I mean, you, no, it's not intelligible. They have to put a name to it that becomes political. Okay, so, so the question, though, is, is it caused by capitalism? Or is it caused by something else? And aside, Walmart, by the way, is a private building that is ma mostly made for utility. Right? How, many of, how many stores do you go visit if you visit Greece or Rome? How many of the, stores, how many of the ancient stores do you visit? None, because they're destroyed. Right? Unless they were beautiful buildings that are still going. But what happens is we sometimes compare like the Parthenon in Greece or the Pantheon in Rome um, to Walmart. But that's not a fair comparison. I think it was Rufus Fear, somebody makes this point, saying that what you have to do is compare public buildings. So I would say let's compare the Grand Rapids Art Museum, the new one, to some buildings in Rome or in Paris. And then we can begin to have a serious discussion. But again, does capitalism cause that? Or is it something else? Um, <clears throat> now, capitalism surely can spread a lot of low culture around really, really fast because capitalism is efficient. Okay, but that it spreads it out doesn't necessarily mean it's a cause. There have actually been capitalist societies that have had quite beautiful art and culture. Okay. In fact, quite sublime art and culture. You've probably heard of one of them. 
what, does anyone, can anyone think of a capitalist society that has unbelievably renowned for its art and architecture? Florence. Florence, Italy. Did you know that Florence was a capitalist economy? Right? And it produced incredible architectural and um, artistic uh, treasures. Now, the question is, and I won't get in, into all that, but the question is, was capitalism the cause of that art or not? It's very hard to find a corollary or a correlation between art and capitalism. Now, there is one correlation between art and capitalism. You have to have money to produce beautiful things. So in one sense, there is a correlation between art and capitalism because as Florence began to develop in the beginning of the 11th century, early 10 hundreds, and through about 1600, you had a, pr a great development of Florence. There's actually some interesting things, and I don't want to get too much into this because I'm still in the process of studying it, but you see the downturn of Florence's econ the Florentine economy. Also, there's some parallels with its artistic downturn as well. Um, but Florence had a market economy, in some ways more free than ours, in some ways less free. There were guilds there, which I might talk about in a couple minutes if I have time. Um, but, but you have this beautiful economy, I mean, sorry, beautiful culture that's funded by a capitalist economy. So why is it if we have so much money that we produce such ugly things when in Florence they produce beautiful things? Is capitalism and markets, are they the cause? Okay, and again, this relates to the question of um, consumerism. Why are we buying up all of these terrible things? Now, Tocqueville worried that you would have in, in mass society and democracy a multitude of people all going around one another just getting vulgar and banal petty pleasures. And he thought, oh my goodness, it's going to be terrible. And then you're going to have over them this large protective state that takes away their freedom. But is that because they're stuff or why do we want that stuff? Another question, of course, is the family. Does capitalism destroy the family? Many people are worried about family breakdown. Now, Again, capitalism and markets absolutely disrupt, can disrupt families. For example, you can have migration and mobility. You've got to move to a new place. You leave your family and your, your family farm. You move to a city. You're by yourself. I mean, these things can be very serious social disruption. And I am not negating them. I'm going to try to talk about them a little bit later if I have time. Um, but the question is, does capitalism cause it? Well, it's hard to say. If we look at pre-industrial families, Rodney Stark says that if you examine the nature of pre-industrial traditional families, he says, quote, it's often cruel and spiteful to an extent that will shock you. He argues that families, in fact, becomes more important than ever and able to provide strong emotional support in industrial societies. Alexis de Tocqueville noted that family bonds, especially between father and son, become sweeter and milder in democracy than they are in in aristocracy, in pre-industrialization, in agrarian societies. Now he said there's some trade-offs. You lose some things and you gain some things. Um, we also see Tocqueville comments that women in the United States married for love. So even if they, you know, their marriage was rough, they were at least happy they made the free decision. Whereas opposed to in, in um, pre-industrial societies, oftentimes marriages were arranged, and not only for the upper classes. Uh, what's that, kind of, something kind of ironic and interesting is a lot of times Marriages were economic arrangements in pre-industrial societies. Right? So we oftentimes think well, capitalism makes everything economic. Well, not marriage, really. Most people don't marry for money. Some do, but if you're in pre-industrial societies, this is a very, very important element. So again, if we look at cultural and family breakdown, the United States had reasonably strong family ties. We're seeing cultural and family breakdown really since the 1960s. Right? And the 1960s radicals, ladies and gentlemen, were not free market capitalists. Okay? They might have been free love, but not free markets. And again, another thing, I'm just throwing these things out. I know that, that I'm, I'm just throwing things out for us to think about because I think we sometimes, when we, when we start thinking about culture and capitalism, we immediately, oh yeah. We, but let's think about it for a minute. How about technology? Many argue that technology destroys our lives. I mean, it really breaks us apart. Okay? It, it, it makes us less human. 
Now, one thing is, and, and technology is directly related to capitalism. Why? Because really you see the emergence of technology in the Industrial Revolution in generally more or less areas where you have private property and rule of law. Right? Because when you have private property and rule of law, people have the incentive to invent new things. You also see it, as Sam Gregg talks about in the, in the Birth of Freedom, in non-slave economies. Because if you have slave economies, this is actually one of the weaknesses of the agrarians. I mean, I have, ladies and gentlemen, I have sympathies with all these things, okay? With free-range chickens and grass-fed beef, okay? <laughs> I've got them all. I've got all the sympathies with it, all right? I'm serious. You know, I read the agrarians, I'm like, yeah. But there's a problem with the agrarians, is that they're able to do, sit on the, the porch sipping mint juleps. One of the reasons is because they have slaves working for them. Okay? So, I mean, we have to keep everything, they, these things have to be, I think, wor worked out here. Now, um, so it is true that technology does disrupt culture. And I think there are some dangers in technology, and, and I would agree with this. Um, for example, uh, Albert Boardman wrote a book called Power Failure, and in it he says, that how, it's how Christianity and technology works together. And he said, one of the things that's happened is that we've lost what he calls a focal point. Okay, the focal point is like, for example, you sit down with your family and you play the guitar and you sing songs around the guitar. Satan does that around the campfire all the time. Okay, and so you're sitting around the guitar and playing the guitar. The guitar is in a sense a focal point, which he makes a distinction from a device as opposed to an iPod where everybody's kind of listening to their own thing. And he says that this is actually a cultural challenge for us. And he's talking about Christians saying, well, you need to be kind of careful. And I think, he, I think he has some good insights. I think we do have to turn off our Blackberry. I mean, if I'm looking at my Blackberry at dinner instead of talking to my children and my wife, that's a serious problem. But the Blackberry and, the, and the, um, an email allows people to work from home, for example, or travel and still stay in contact with their family. I mean, there's a host of positive things that come from technology. And I think fundamentally, technology gives us an insight into um, where the real question comes. The real question comes in human choice and sin. I don't think we should use our blackberries at the table. We should talk to our children. Right? And it's a challenge. But is that technology's fault or is that human choice? I would argue that generally it's human choice. Now, of course, there's a serious problem in technology because just because you can do something doesn't mean you shouldn't. I mean, you should, I should say. It doesn't mean you should. So just because you can clone doesn't mean you should. Right? And again, technology is, comes from techne, but who are the people that are allowed? I mean, the only being that can do technology in this created order is us. Animals don't have technology. So it's a human, it's a human uh, achievement and it's a human challenge. It doesn't just force us through and we have to make decisions. Okay. Um, now, I also talk, I think I mentioned deracination, lacking roots. Yes, capitalism can create deracination, quite serious deracination, deracination, especially early on when you have people moving into cities, leaving their families, they're by themselves. All right? But it's also an opportunity. For example, you have more access to churches, to culture, to a host of other things in cities. And and so, so I'm going to skip deracination, but I, but I do think that when we think about deracination, I would, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, is that mostly the solution to that is a strong, rich civil society, strong family life, right? And it's not just the cause of capitalism. Okay. Um, other times, one of the other critiques you hear a lot is homogenization. Everything's the same. I mean, no matter where I go, you've got Walmart, Lowe's, Best Buy, Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, this is true. Sometimes it's kind of boring. There's global brands. Do you know what? You know, if you've studied business, you know what a global brand does, right? A brand, a global brand means that no matter where you go in the world, it's McDonald's. I know that I'm going to get a hamburger, and I know what it's going to taste like. You don't know what the other store is, so people go to McDonald's. So there are benefits to that because no matter where you are, you walk into McDonald's and know what you're going to get, whether you're in Nicaragua or Paris. Um, and there's also a demand for that, for quality. Um, now, the problem, I think, is, is that while there is, in some ways, more homogeneity, we sometimes have a romantic notion like in primitive societies or, or pre-industrial societies or um, even in the current developing world, these big box corporations come in and destroy kind of homogeneity. Well, there aren't that many choices in these places. 
In the modern supermarket, there's an average of 47,000 products in the modern supermarket. Okay, that's not homogeneity. Right? And sometimes we have to compare likes with like. And so I would argue that, that while in some ways there's homogeneity, and it is some, sometimes you know, kind of disturbing to go through every suburb and see the same five stores right, and the same products, um, compared to what? And then what are the trade-offs and what are the negatives? I'm not trying to give an answer to that. Now, let me also talk about food. Food's very complex, but let me just throw it out there. People are, are, are very worried about industrialization and factory farming and how this just destroys food. It takes away its nutrients. It does a host of other things. It also separates people from food. And this is a problem, they say, right? Because, and there, I think there's some serious concerns here. It's a problem. If people don't know how chickens are produced or how, how their meat comes to them, I do think it's a problem. I mean, this is sometimes why you see this kind of radical anti-hunting stuff in the, in the environment. I think part of it's because these environmentalists, they don't understand if you have lots of deer, they get sick and die and create disease for others. I mean, there, there's, there's a, there is a separation between our lives in modern industrial life and food. And so, but one of the arguments is that capitalism is the source of this. Well, in some ways, sure. Industrialized food production does separate us from our food, but it also allows for urban centers, right, for cities, if you look at gapminder.com, you can see, for example, life expectancy and per capita GNP, and you see as countries industrialize, get industrialized and more globalized, you have higher life expectancy and higher GDP. Um, Father Sirico gave a lecture last year, and if some of you were there, you might remember he handed out this little um, cartoon, and there, there were these two Stone Age guys sitting down talking to each other. I don't know if you, some of you might remember it or have seen it, and the one says, you know, I don't understand what's wrong. We all have free-range chicken and grass-fed beef and or everything's organic, but nobody lives past 35. Um, so th there are trade-offs. And I think that if we're going to discuss them, uh, then we need to be aware of the trade-offs. Now, let me, let me um, tell you a couple of quick more things, and then I'm going to go into uh, uh, Tocqueville, I think. Um, Another one is industrialization. Industrialization is ugly. This is one of the arguments of the, of the Southern agrarians. It's not only ugly, but it just kind of vitiates human life. And we need an agrarian culture where we're on the farm, et cetera. Well, there are ugly buildings. There are ugly smokestacks, right? Um, in the past, you had terrible working conditions in industrialization, and you still do today in many places. Um, Several things happen with industrialization that are a problem. Matt Crawford, in a book called Shop Class as Soulcraft, talks about how modern industrialization and kind of the assembly line separates thinking from doing. And this is a problem. Well, guess who else recognized this? Adam Smith did, too. He worried about the stupefying effects of just doing the same thing over and over. And so Crawford's making a case for the trades that we need to, we need to reconnect these, these things. He's not making necessarily a case against industrialization. Um, but one of the problems with industrialization is a remnant ideas of what Marx predicted, right? And the distributivists actually fall prey to this as well. Um, Marx said there was going to be small upper class with huge proletariat. Okay, but what we found, and this was not crazy because if you, if you look at kind of industrialization, you look at the beginnings of, of agrarian lifestyle, and then you see kind of the social stratification that exists in pre-industrial societies, you have big, huge proletariat peasant class and and small kind of nobility with a couple of merchant class in, in the middle, and that this would, could be even exacerbated by industrialism. It's not a crazy idea, but he was wrong. But that's not what happened. The middle class began to thrive. And in fact, the gap in the standard of living began to decrease with industrialization. Also, there was an increase in social mobility because you could, incre you could change your life based on merit and not on family history. <clears throat> so what you see is that industrialization does have some negative effects. It has negative effects on the landscape, but it also allows for cities. For example, most cities in pre-industrialization were extremely small. 40, 50,000 was a big, big city. Per Berlin, in, in I think the 1390s, I have a note here, had, Berlin had 6,000 people in it. Amsterdam, 7,400 people in 1470. Paris, 59,000. Rome, 55,000. 
Rome, ancient Rome, actually had 500,000 people in it. It was massive. And that's because they controlled all the waterways, all the shipping, et cetera. And so they were able to have this. You did not have large urban centers where a lot of good things take place, and there are challenges as well, until you have industrialized agriculture. So, and you also have higher life expectancy, less <coughs> disease, et cetera. And it's very important not to kind of glorify um, pre-industrial cities. They were dark, dirty, <coughs> disease-risen, and extremely <coughs> dangerous places. People would come out, do you say so is Florence, yeah. Um, <laughs> People would come out at, no, at night with you know, torches and guards. They wouldn't go out. I mean, it's very dangerous. So it's important that we don't romanticize. In fact, cities are much safer today than they were in pre-industrialized times. Um, now, um, you also see, for example, social mobility. This is very important, especially, I think, for most of us in this room. Social mobility is very important because most of us who live in the United States and in industrialized countries, if we lived in a pre-industrialized nation, we would be in um, we would be, most likely, most of us, um, would be the peasant class. Right? We'd be farmers, laborers, etc. cetera. Um, Seymour Martin Lipset and Reinhard Benix did a study of social mobility in the 50s. And they showed both higher mobility in industrialized nations and also what they called structural mobility. That, was, that means that the whole structures of mobility move up. Like you have brand new professional classes that need workers and it gives the opportunity for people to move up. Further, they've done further studies. Blau and Duncan in 1967 did a study about what they called long distance mobility. And this is in industrialized societies. Manual workers, for example, they did a study. One in 10 of the sons of manual workers in the United States moved up to an elite management or professional, professional, professional class. Right? For Italians, it was only one in 300 at that time. And for Danes, it was one in 100. This was in the 60s. Okay? Now, this, of course, also affects attitudes and culture. Perhaps, like I said, in some negative ways, where you have kind of like a, uh, you have this maybe kind of over competitiveness and, and this idea of kind of the management guru culture getting in and shaping the way we do things. Sure. But also, it has some positive effects on culture. For example, when asked how important are certain things for getting ahead in life, Rodney Stark has a study that says, the questions are coming from, an important, from a wealthy family, political connections, or hard work. In Italy, 40% of people say coming from a wealthy family is very important for getting ahead in life. 55 say, I mean, sorry, it's not, it's not percent of people. It's 55% 55 say that political connections are very important. And 57% for hard work is very important. Interestingly, in the United States, what's very important for getting ahead in life? Is it very important to come from a wealthy family? 14% said, said yes. Political connections? 9% said yes. Hard work? 89% said yes. Similar statistics in Great Britain, except higher for a wealthy family. So what you see, in fact, is that's, a, that's not a negative thing to say, hey, if I work really hard and I use the gifts God gave me, I can make something of myself, is not necessarily something to, to scoff at if you think, well, the only way I can get ahead in life is if I've got political connections. Now, oligarchies and certain types of capitalism actually exacerbate the negative type of things, like if you don't have political connections, if you don't, aren't from a wealthy family. But a competitive market economy in industrialization actually allows for a whole host of opportunities for human flourishing. It doesn't guarantee human flourishing, ladies and gentlemen, but at least it, it, it gives the opportunity. Tocqueville remarked in Democracy in America that not only did you see social upward mobility, but people were proud to have come from low roots. Can you imagine? I'm from a poor family and I made it. In Europe, everybody say, well, you're yeah, very important, very happy to be here. Right? They've always been there. <laughs> so there are positives and, and there are negatives. <coughs> Let me say one quick thing about guilds and then I'm going to go to Tocqueville and, and, and conclude. How much time? Okay, I have some more time. Okay. All right. Another thing is people will say, well, you know, industrialization, it's really bad. They've got, it, it breaks people up. It, it creates anonymity. People don't have security in their jobs. They, they move from one place to the next. They can get fired, et cetera, et cetera. And we need more security, and we need guilds. And, and we need not this kind of mobility moving around. Well, there were some problems in guilds. For example, 
there's a moral problem of guilt. The scholastic theologians, the medieval theologians, criticized guilt because they violated free association and they artificially kept prices high and oftentimes kept the quality of goods low. Also, guilds have negative economic impacts. They employ, they only benefit certain segments of the people, right? And it's not really good for the regular citizen, the, the regular customer who's just trying to live his life. He has to pay higher prices for necessities than he would if you didn't have guilds. In the long run, it's actually bad for the country or the city-state because they lose the industry. For example, textiles moved from Florence to the United Kingdom as the guilds got stronger and stronger. Guess what was the most famous watchmaking country in the world before Switzerland? A place called England. England made the best watches in the world. And what they did is they had the guilds created power to stop innovation and everything moved to Switzerland. It almost happened in Switzerland and started moving to other places and then the Swiss learned their lesson. Um, there's also moral and cultural problems of discrimination. People sometimes romanticize about kind of pre-industrial guild societies and say, oh, wasn't it great when we didn't have kind of um, savage capitalism? I'm not sure what that means, but um, for example, Jerry Muller in his book, The Mind of the Market, does a study of Julius Mosner, who talks about guilds. G Mosner was a big supporter of guilds. Guilds actually said, this was in Germany, that if you were born out of wedlock, you couldn't get into the guild. Okay, so think about that. I mean, that's a double hit. Not only were your mother and father not responsible enough for, to get married before you were born, right? right? But now you can't get into a guild. Now, I don't know if that's, I don't, that doesn't strike me as a morally wonderful thing that we should look back to. I think there are some serious, so, so you see, for example, in, in market competitive capitalism, on the question of merit, a whole host of things can happen that are positive. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am not arguing that everything is perfect and wonderful and that, that, that things are great and that capitalism makes everything. No, there are some very serious cultural problems that we face. And I do think capitalism and market economies exacerbate them. I think they create disruption and, and volatility. And I also think they take bad stuff and produce lots of it really efficiently. And they spread it around and they can create needs for things. So for example, take pornography. Pornography, in the past, you would kind of have to go somewhere to get pornography, right? So you're walking into like the peep house or something and people might see you. Now you can do it from your house. That's a danger. It's a challenge. Okay, that's a serious cultural challenge. Um, now, I've laid out a lot of things to think about. And I, and I kind of decided to do this because I thought, as I was thinking about this, it's so complex that, and we sometimes just say, oh, culture's this, capitalism's this, and we look at one idea that I wanted to throw out kind of the positives and negatives. And I think you can probably see from, from what I'm saying that, yes, I do think there are worries from capitalism, but I also think there are a lot of positives. And I would challenge the idea that capitalism destroys culture. I would challenge that idea. I would say, yes, it creates volatility and social disruption, but there are other forces much more problematic today than capitalism, okay? I would argue that secularism, cultural socialism, liberal progressivism are more important and influential in destroying culture than capitalism. I would say, people say, oh, we have a capitalist culture. I actually think, ladies and gentlemen, we have something much worse than a capitalist culture. We have a more or less capitalist economy, right? A managerial capitalist economy with a secular progressive culture and political centralization. And this is a potent and dangerous mix for society and for culture and human flourishing. The problem is, it's much easier to blame capitalism for our ills. Why? Because one, the instability caused by capitalism is much easier to see. We can see it. We can see structural employment. Two, because Marxian analysis, as I said, there's still a remnant. We kind of looked for the economy to be this driving, so, uh, the, this driving force of all social organization. And I think that's false. Three, it's easier to blame ostensibly inanimate forces like markets than it is to blame our own selves or human so sin or, cho or choice. And I think four, because for some people, capitalism becomes a proxy, whether clearly or, or, or unclearly, a proxy for critiques of problems within liberalism in general. And the critique of capitalism is more politically acceptable than, say, a critique of democracy. Right? If you're a critic of democracy, you're not going to get very far in 2010. But capitalism, that's acceptable. Or even critiquing the welfare state. Now, 
Whatever the reasons, I think the focus on capitalism misses other very important tendencies within society that are deeper sources of social integration. Now, I also think if you're going to talk about capitalism, you have to accept the positive benefits. Most of you know them, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You have to accept that it helps the poor. It, the rich and the poor can get richer. That's what the data shows. It's not the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. The rich and the poor get richer. Maybe the rich get faster, but they both get richer. It limits the state and creates space for people to live out their freedoms. It allows for competition. Right? It allows people to change jobs and move to get new opportunities. It follows the principle of subsidiarity, people creating solutions to their own problems. It reduces the occasion for envy and can reduce social and class tension. Right? But there are negative things, and I've talked about some of the negative things, and I think we have to be aware of them. One of them is market competitive market economies create creative destruction. New enterprises come up, old ones are pushed aside. The horse and buggy industry is gone when the car industry comes, and all those people are out of work. Right? These are serious realities. We can't ignore them. I think to say, oh, who cares? It's just a statistic. Well, no, it's not statistic. They're people, and they're social problems, and we have to address them. The question is, how do we address them, and what's the cause? Um, you see negative impacts on mobility and migration on families. Structural unemployment, like I said. Technology, social change. False concepts of autonomy and creativity. Consumerism. Now, socialism had consumerism too, but it's a different kind of consumerism. You see this kind of management, crude business mentality, you know. C.S. Lewis calls this the trousered ape, right? The person who looks at the sea and only sees salt. I think I could get a lot of salt from that, right? He doesn't see the sublimity of this. Okay, now Daniel Bell in his book, Cultural uh, Contradictions of Capitalism, actually makes a point, and I think it's almost kind of refuting part of his argument, but he makes this point that, that what, one of the problems, he says, capitalism adopts a Benthamite, Jeremy Bentham, utilitarian ethic. Well, fine, I think that's a very serious problem, but that's not inherent to markets. And sometimes we often think about how capitalism and business shape culture, but how does culture and philosophy shape capitalism and business? And we have to, it has to go both ways. So, but as I said, one of the key things capitalism does is it creates volatility and anxiety. And so the question is, how do we get the benefits of capitalism while mitigating some of the negative effects? And I think Tocqueville is illustrative here. Tocqueville says in his Democracy in America, he worried about the negative effects of democracy. Now some of these negative effects of democracy parallel the exact same things we see in capitalism. And he said you need local politics, civil society, and strong religion. But of course this is part of the problem. We don't have strong religion. We have minimal local politics, I think there's a big local politic thing going on tonight. I'll, I'm, I'm going to find the detail, but there's something going on tonight with like, there's all, anyway, so there's local politics happening. Here it is, okay. So, um, uh, there's, we don't have strong local politics, and we have a broken civil society. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, and they're not necessarily capitalism. Okay, so capitalism does have negative effects, but you can't analyze capitalism in isolation. And it's far from the main disorder, I would argue. If you look at what I would call a socialist culture and liberal culture, you see a deep crisis of reason. People have rejected reason as only the empirical. A deep crisis of truth. People have rejected truth. And, and we have a strong relativist culture and society. There's a crisis of beauty where beauty is separated from reason, from representation, from reality, it's merely self-expression, okay? Much of this problem, of course, can be summed up by the term secularism. Um, there are strong, as I said, socialist cultural influences and liberal cultural influences. Um, some of you have heard me talk about this before, um, that despite the fall of the Berlin Wall, we still have strong socialist cultural influences. Remember that socialism is broader than economics. Friedrich Engels, Karl Marx's co-author, wrote that the three primary obstacles to social reform are private property, religion, and quote, this present form of marriage. Okay, private property, religion, and this present form of marriage. If we examine modern attitudes, habits, and beliefs, we find socialist thought shapes the way many people think about a host of important things. 
And ideas that were radical 75 years ago are normal now or even praised. Look at family breakdown. Look at the marriage deficit. Look at the people who don't believe in marriage because it's a bourgeois institution. Well, that's socialist influence. Okay? Um, Theodore Adorno wrote, the institution of marriage is raised on barbaric sexual oppression, which tendentially compels the man to take lifelong responsibility for someone with whom he once took pleasure in sleeping with. <laughs> he, was a, he was a Frankfurt Marxist. Okay? We see it in Engels in his de desire to destroy, quote, this present form of marriage with the whole gay marriage movement. Right? And these are not capitalist thinkers, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? In fact, one of the reasons they're opposed to the family is because they see the family as a source of capitalism. Family and private property are a source of capitalism. But of course, the problem is much bigger than socialism. Part of it's a precisely a crisis of liberalism, especially of the Rousseauian continental strand, of which socialism is the intellectual child. Okay, Hayek recognizes socialism is the intellectual child of liberalism. Okay, and we see this. We see nominalist concepts of freedom. Freedom is just do what you want. Exercise your will, you know, whatever it is. Right? I sometimes give the example, some of you might have heard it before. If I start banging my head on this podium, you wouldn't say, wow, he's so free. <laughs> right? You would think, well, he's crazy, right? Because freedom separated from truth and reason are crazy. Pervasive relativism, hey, don't judge me, man. Okay? Radical equality of the Rousseauian sort. This, of course, influences the whole gay marriage question. Um, radical autonomy and what could be called methodological individualism that comes from Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. I'm just this person just kind of popped in the world and I'll figure myself out, okay? Which is clearly an attempt to redefine the Christian Genesis narrative. Okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's important to remember these cultural shifts, which I think all of you are aware of, are very relevant to our discussion of economics because they lead to cultural disintegration and individualism that actually exacerbates the volatility that arises from global capitalism. And this is all made worse by centralization. Because then you have a big, large, leviathan bureaucratic state that pushes out the intermediary institutions, private charity, and a host of the other things that need to help create social bonds. And so you see a decline in private charity, mutual aid societies, et cetera, et cetera. And with this weakening of civil society that's caused by cultural breakdown, so philosophical problems, and by centralization, you see a breakdown of authentic solidarity right? and this inability to handle the negatives that come from capitalism. We often hear the image of a tiger applied to capitalism. I think that's an interesting image. You know, the Celtic tigers, the Asian tigers. Well, think of capitalism as like a tiger. It's a very powerful force, and it's going to do a lot of good. It's going to get what it wants. But it also has a powerful tail. And that tail will whip through culture like you've never seen. And so you need certain things to mitigate those negative forces. Right? But the answer is not the state. In fact, the state makes it worse because the state, in fact, vitiates those things you need. Strong families and a rich, vibrant civil society Good local politics, which means decentralization, and, power, and, and a really strong religion. And this is what Tocqueville said. He said that, that, de that democracy had many positive things, but it had some very negative ones. One of them was individualism, turning people into themselves. And the other one was that equality would create an excessive love of comfort. And that we would want stuff. And think of consumerism. Okay. And it would create a stupefying condition that would reduce men to, to sheep following a shepherd. And he said, you've got to have local politics because it gets them involved. It checks the state. It makes them deal with one another to solve their own problems. It gets them out of themselves. You need civil society, as I said, because it helps people solve problems voluntarily by themselves. I don't mean non-governmental organizations, OK? I mean private charity, mutual aid societies, so that if you move into a new uh, community, right, and you, you don't just have you and the bureaucracy. You've got you and even if you're apart from your family, you've got your churches and your church and your, you know, the men's groups and women's groups and Elks Club and all of these kind of things that are very important. 
If you think of the Knights of Columbus, right? The Knights of Columbus aren't just, they don't just do pancake breakfasts, okay? They do pancake breakfasts, okay? But they don't just do pancake breakfasts. They also provide insurance, life insurance, okay? But most important, of course, is religion. Because Tocqueville said you cannot have a free society if you don't have morality. And you cannot have morality if you don't have religion. And a free market economy means there's going to be a free society. Okay? So these same things, decentralization, strong civil society, religion, are necessary to temper the excesses in a commercial society and to control that whipping tail. Together they promote strong social bonds, encourage family life, provide respite and ref refuge against anonymity, assist individuals and families when they need to move to new cities for work, or find themselves battling unemployment. They help shape people and keep them connected. It's very dangerous for people to feel they're completely detached from any social, familial, or religious bonds. And we're seeing this take increasingly happen. This not only leads to loneliness and depression or anonymity, but also can encourage like a nominalist, kind of Sartrean expression of the will. I'm just going to do something because I'm free and I'm separate. And, this any, and people will engage in destructively and morally evil behavior that they would never engage in had they had any connections. Okay? The person can end up seeing himself in kind of a an atomistic way, a tabula rasa. He's going to recreate himself through a new brand or whatever it might be. And this is further exacerbated, this lack of rootedness from not capitalism, but no civil society and religion, is exacerbated by a brand culture where people find their identity and unique self-expression not in virtues or developing a rich personality and authentic human relationships, but instead by wearing the latest fashions or doing the newest cool thing. It's interesting to me to notice the development of what I'm calling bumper sticker identity. Have you noticed this? I don't mean like vote for Gore, vote for Bush, vote for Bush. I don't mean that. I don't mean like your typical political thing. I mean, you've got like Outer Banks. Like in Virginia, you always see Outer bank stickers. Or Mac beats PC. Okay? Or I'm an outdoorsman. I was driving and there was a Jeep in front of me and there was like 14 bumper stickers. And I learned a lot about this person. For he was a Jeep. He liked fishing. He liked a certain kind of dog. He liked outdoor, a certain type of outdoor activity, and he wanted to let me know that he was an outdoorsman. That's who he was, and he let me know that through his bumper sticker identity. I know someone who actually has a bumper sticker that says, my pit bull is smarter than your honor student. <laughs> okay. We also see problems with technology, right? And I've talked about this, and I'm going to go quickly, and I'll end here, that technology has a lot of benefits. But it also can prevent true intersubjective communication. And this, when you have lack of religious practice and breakdown of family and less civil society, becomes even more dangerous. You see people with f Facebook and Twitter and blogging, um, you s see people saying and doing things they would never do or say in front of live human beings. We witness malicious ad hominem attacks attacking the, uh, it, it, taking the place of discussion. Outrageous behavior such as sexting or self-pornography that would rarely take place in any face-to-face -face social relationship. Right? I, I once, there was a video that, I, that we put out at Acton and I was in the video, I was talking about healthcare. And one guy told me to go hang myself. I never respond, but I almost want to say no. I mean, can you imagine? Like, and I think we shouldn't have socialized health care. Go hang yourself! I mean, can you, no one in this room would stand up and scream at me that way, right? But in technology, you can say stuff. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable what people have. Okay, um, now, so, so there are serious cultural problems. But we don't need the state and centralization, which as many people want. We need a cultural rejuvenation and we need religion. And we don't need any religion. We need a coherent religion that preaches truth, not waters it down and tries to be really hip and cool social justice. The church and the Christian-inspired groups have been the greatest force for providing templates of authentic human connectivity. And it needs to do this and not look to the state as a substitute. So the title of my lecture was, Does Capitalism Destroy Culture? And I think that one, the question doesn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> but at least you came. Uh, 
Capitalism and market economies do indeed, as I've said, create social disruption and can change culture, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worst. But capitalism is not and should not be seen as the key determining factor in culture and social organization. The facts are we have received lots of benefits from market economies. It's created space for us to live out our lives, freedom and opportunity. And as I said, almost all of us would not be in this room able to think about things, have the time to come here for lunch and talk about these uh, ephemeral things if we didn't have markets that create all of these things that we like. Right? And remember, if we get rid of markets, then there's not going to be the local coffee shop and all that. It's not, it doesn't, that's not what happens. You have to remember causality. There are clearly types of bad capitalism, oligarchy, big corporate capitalism, corporate welfare, managerial capitalism. And we have to watch it. And we have to make sure that, that those things don't happen. And I think those of us who defend markets have to be very careful that we don't just kind of be reactionary to the left. Like, oh, I don't like markets. Well, I like markets. You know, and you start defending kind of big business subsidized uh, capitalism. No, we have, to be, say, we have to be able to make, I think, a precise argument. Um, but we can't look to the capitalism as the source of our social ills. It's not. The Catholic historian Christopher Dawson reminds us that it's not the economic structure that's the primary shaper of culture, but it is cultus, it is religion. That's the drives social organization. So today we have a secularist culture, and this is where many of the problems lie. Not in capitalism or market economies, which as we know preceded both secularism and liberalism. Lord Acton wrote that religion is the key to everything. And as Tocqueville summarizes well, when a nation's religion is destroyed, doubt takes grip upon intelligence, and man despairs of ever resolving his greatest problem and retreats in problems and retreats into not thinking at all. He says, such a state cannot fail to weaken the soul. It strains the forces of the soul and shapes the citizens for slavery. If a man is without faith, he must serve someone. And if he is free, he must believe. Thank you.